you religious? No. Do you believe in God? No. Soros told us he believes God was created by man, not the other way around, which may be why he thinks he can smooth out the world's imperfections. One of your money manager told us uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, George really does think he's a god. <laughs> Lawmakers are investigating after the FCC fast tracks George Soros' deal to buy 200 radio stations, reaching 165 million Americans weeks. It's that time of year for pumpkin patches and hay rides. And a warning, two boys were killed just a day apart in separate hay riding accidents. Stephen Fabian spoke with an expert for some tips on how you can hay ride safely. It's a beloved ritual of autumn going on a hay ride. But recent accidents that left two little ones dead and another that injured 25 people are putting a spotlight on hay ride safety. 13-year-old Alexander Mick was accidentally run over and killed by a tractor during a haunted hayride in Minnesota. In Tennessee, 12-year-old Sam Jessen lost his life after being struck by a hay wagon. And in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, 25 people were injured when a hayride overturned. I was the worst one on that wagon except my teacher. Five-year-old Gabe Meyer is recovering from the accident. Gabe, this must have been scary for you to have to go to the it, hospital. Um, it was the scariest day of our life. He had horrible road rash along the side of his scalp. He had a laceration in the front. He's got the skull fracture on top, a skull fracture in the back. And a bruised brain. Aw, oh, buddy, I'm so sorry, man. Hay rides are a fun family experience for kids and adults this fall season all over the country, but accidents can happen. So we came to Dr. Davies Farm in Congress, New York, to find out the safety tips you need to know to stay safe on a hay ride. Welcome to Dr. Davies Apple Orchard. Make sure that they're sitting, there's no walking around, right? and uh, that they keep their hands inside the trailer. They go to grab an apple or grab the branch, and they could fall out over the side of the sure. trailer. Thomas Mulcahy also insists on blasting the horn every time they make a stop to keep from accidentally hitting someone. And you check yes. the tire pressure. You check just to make sure all the mechanicals are working right. Yes. And every morning, I get the guys to take a look around the trailer and make sure that none of the bolts are loose because they do loosen because of, you know, uh, the vibration and stuff like right. that. But the number one rule, take it slow. No rush. Take your time. We'll get there when we get there. Be religious? No. Do you believe in God? No. Soros told us he believes God was created by man, not the other way around, which may be why he thinks he can smooth out the world's imperfections. One of your money manager told us uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, George really does think he's a god. <laughs> Lawmakers are investigating after the FCC fast tracks George Soros deal to buy 200 radio stations, reaching 165 million Americans weeks before the election. Soros deal to buy 200 radio stations, reaching 165 million Americans weeks before the election. With the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade, and they did as he intended. expressing concerns. The FC here is not following its normal process for viewing a transaction. It seems to me that the FCC is poised to create, for the first time, an entirely new shortcut. Look, this Soros-backed group is looking to buy the second largest radio station group in the country. We're talking over 200 
radio stations across more than 40 markets. First of all, it's important for every American to understand, truly not just Americans, but anyone living in any society on Earth, how influential Soros has been throughout his career. But here back at home in America, to truly understand the power of the Open Society Foundation. Well, you know, Soros has long used money to promote his political views, but not everyone is convinced that his view of Baltimore is the healthiest view. In the city of Baltimore, hundreds of nonprofit organizations are fueled by the dollars of donors. And lately, one of the chief donors has been billionaire philanthropist George Soros. He funds a lot of good work. Uh, he funds a lot of very controversial things as well. For 25 years, the only U.S. field office for Soros' Open Society Foundation was located in downtown Baltimore. And for 25 years, his foundation pumped millions of dollars into Baltimore's nonprofits. Parker Thayer, who has long studied Soros' philanthropy, says most of all of it is aimed at promoting his far-left political views. He likes to use his philanthropic and political giving empire to circumvent things that slow him down, like the legislature and the Constitution. Thayer says there's nothing illegal about the gift-giving, but believes it should be scrutinized. Not all of the recipients, he says, have succeeded, and he says not all of them may be good for Baltimore. The problem with the Soros Network is that the people leading it think they have more knowledge and are smarter than everybody else in the world. They don't. No, I think you meant to go to the smaller one down the street. So that moment we brought to you yesterday. After she talked about overturning Roe v. Wade and Donald Trump, I yelled out to the crowd that a is a sacrament of Satan. And when I said that, I deeply do believe that as a Christian. And about 10 seconds go by, and that's when the video of uh, my friend Grant and I uh, proclaiming that Christ is Lord and Jesus is King. Uh, when we said that, there's about five seconds after or before she tells us to go to a smaller rally down the street. You can see on the video she waves. She waves. She was actually waving to me. I uh, took this cross off my neck that I wear, and as we were getting asked to leave, um, I held it up in the air and waved at her and pointed to her, and she looked directly in the eye, kind of gave me an evil smirk. And, um, yeah, I just want to clear that up and confirm that she 100% was talking to us. I was shocked when I heard that Kabbalah was... Skipping the Al Smith dinner, I'd really hope that she would come because we can't get enough of hearing her beautiful laugh instead of attending tonight. She's in Michigan receiving communion from Gretchen Whitmer. If you really wanted Vice President Harris to accept your invitation, I guess you should have told her the funds were going to bail out the looters and rioters in Minneapolis, and she would have been here guaranteed. Catholics will be a key demographic in every battleground state. I'm sorry, why is Vice President Harris not here? As I said on Friday, the great and the good of Catholic New York, including the Cardinal, got together for the annual Al Smith dinner, which is where politicians and presidential candidates take the proverbial out of one another. And Trump certainly took the brief, he took the opportunity, though he did open with a shot at himself. Sort of. This. It's a true pleasure to be with you this evening. Amazing pleasure. And uh, these days it's uh, really a pleasure anywhere in New York without a subpoena for my appearance. Naturally, Kamala Harris was the target of much of the routine. Have a look at this. Campaigning can take a toll on a family and family life, although I hear that Kamala and her husband carve out some real time at the end of the day for an intimate dinner just dug her and the teleprompter that she uses quite well <laughs> the affinity group white dudes for harris also cop to serve there's a group called white dudes for harris have you seen this white dudes for harris does anybody know it by some of you here white dudes for it doesn't sound like it but i'm not worried about them at all because their wives and their wives lovers are all voting for me all because their wives and their wives' lovers are all voting for me. 
Soros is now 93 years old and recently turned over his philanthropic activities to his son, who is vowing to become even more politically active than his father. I mean, who elected Soros to dictate public policy and laws? Why, why does he feel entitled to impose his agenda on unelected bureaucrats? are trying to instate public policy. Who elected them? They don't have a democratic mandate. If they want a seat in the table, they should run for office. Of all the financial titans and philanthropists of the 20th century, none are more complex or mysterious than George Soros. Like Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and the Rockefellers, he amassed billions through ruthless business decisions, only to turn around and give away most of his fortune to advance his own personal philosophy. He can move world financial markets simply by voicing an opinion, or destabilize a government by buying and selling its currency. He also pledged more aid last year to help people in Russia than the U.S. government did. But now George Soros is worried. He thinks the global economy is coming apart at the seams, and that the world needs to be protected from people like George Soros. But the fact is that the system is broke and it needs fixing. What you're doing is, is, is asking uh, some form of regulation to protect the world against you. Well, uh, I am a player and I think all players should be regulated. There have to be rules of the game. So, Ajit, when you look at George Soros and you look at his political contributions, we're talking about $60 million to Democrats, or whether it's his organization or directly from him, I guess the question is, how is he able to get away with this? If this is not your typical process, is it because of the politicians that he has alliances with? Well, I think that's what the House Oversight Committee and others are going to be looking into, including Congressman Chip Roy, who flagged this issue in the spring. For me, at least, as a former FCC official, this is the reason why we have these rules, so that everybody has to play by the same process. According to the New York Post, foreign company ownership of U.S. radio stations is not allowed to exceed 25%. But a filing acquired by the Post details Soros is asking the commission to make an exception. Here, they're trying to do something that's never been done before at the commission level. Yeah, I, I, I must say, Commissioner, I am I'm extremely alarmed at what's happening with this transaction. This is very unprecedented. Looking at the facts, it seems that the administration is giving a left-wing billionaire who is a major donor, a close ally, you know, one of the chief funders of all of their efforts and their dark money, a free pass to take control of hundreds of local radio stations. Which makes you wonder what maybe he's heard in the confession box. Now, Trump also took this shot at Tim Waltz. I used to think that Democrats were crazy for saying that men have periods, but then I met Tim Waltz. <laughs> Not even would-be first fella Doug Emhoff, that's Kamala's husband, who has been praised by the left for giving America a new definition of masculinity, was spared. Major issue of this race is child care, and Kamala has put forward a concept of a plan a lot of people don't like it. The only piece of advice I would have for her in the event that she wins would be not to let her husband, Doug, anywhere near the nannies. Just keep him away. That's a nasty one. That's nasty. Oh, yeah, that was nasty. All in all, though, it was quite the tour de force. A lot of laughter. Maybe even you might say a bit of joy. Hey, speaking of joy... Let's go back to the campaign trail and see how the happy warrior Kamala Harris is tracking, shall we? Would never again have the privilege of standing behind the seal of the president of the United States. Never again. Never again. Never again. Now, Donald Trump is calling for CBS to have its license pulled over Kamala Harris's recent interview, of course, with 60 Minutes, claiming it was edited to make her look good. This is what he said. She gives an answer that was shows that she's dumb or incompetent or something wrong with her. It's so bad that the people at CBS say, we're going to do a little editing, like the word the, make it there. So 
something. You understand? They take the whole ridiculous answer out, and it was a long answer, and replace it with a much shorter answer that she did having to do with a totally different subject, which also didn't make sense. Alex, why won't CBS just release the unedited tapes? And you mentioned the lefty media. Look, let's talk about MSNBC, the usual uh, lunatic broadcasting station. They're having an absolute freak out. Host Al Sharpton and frequent guest Donny Deutsch claim that Donald Trump would place them on an enemies list if he was elected president again. Have a look. Rev, are you worried going forward that you're on a list if Donald Trump is elected? Yes or no? Um convinced I'll be on the list. I, I am too. I don't know how we're not going to be. And think about that. This is America. This is the United States of America and people in the media like the Rev have to be concerned that they may be on a list. I have people saying to me, Donnie, are you worried? This is America. And yet people will still give permission to vote for Donald Trump. What's wrong with us? Now, let's talk about the Al Smith dinner, the one, of course, come that Kamala Harris missed and sent in this really, really cringeworthy pre-recorded video instead. Your eminence and distinguished guests, the Al Smith dinner provides a rare opportunity to set aside partisanship. Oh, we're sorry, sorry. Hey, what's going on? Who was that? Oh, sorry, Mary Campanelli. Mary Campanelli. It's so nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Mary Catherine. Right now, I'm trying to record my speech for tonight's dinner. Oh, yeah, I know. I just want to say that I'm a Catholic, and tonight is one of the biggest dinners next to the Last Supper. It is a very important dinner, and it's an important tradition that I'm so proud to be a part of. Ugh, good grave. Donald Trump would actually probably do an interview with somebody, even if they are a leftist, even if they are, you know, a sad excuse for a journalist. Donald Trump will still speak to those people, so they don't realize this would help their ratings much more than Kamala Harris will probably get us into World War III or a recession or financial collapse in the next four years, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Anti-Christian rhetoric and anti-Christian approach to public policy. I don't in the last two years, you've been blamed for financial collapse of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, and Russia. All of the, all of the above. That's all of the above. Yeah, yeah. Are you that powerful? No, I think there's a great misunderstanding. The Prime Minister of, of Malaysia yes. um, said that the region spent 40 years trying to build up its economy, and along comes a moron like Soros right. with a lot of money, and it's all over. He called you a criminal. It's easier for him to blame an outside force. I think that uh, I've been blamed, blamed for everything. I am basically there to, uh, um, to make money. I cannot and do not look at the social consequences of, of what I do. Part of the reason he is so rich is that the Soros hedge funds operate offshore in the Netherlands Antilles to avoid scrutiny by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So even while Soros tells Congress and the Treasury that hedge funds must be regulated to stop the global crisis, he's avoiding the rules. Why is it that, uh, that Americans can't invest in the quantum fund? It's an offshore fund. Why is that? Because the fund is not registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, so so uh, uh, we, we are not licensed to do business in the United States. That's right. Because? Be, because we are not registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We, 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 because we, we find it more convenient to operate without it. So in some ways it's to escape regulation. Yeah, that's right. You've been sitting here talking about uh, the need for regulation. Yes, and uh, whatever regulations are imposed, we will obey. We will. We will. We, we already confirm to everything. Uh, conform to everything. If you're asking me right now. I probably did have deputies that prevented the third assassination attempt. In just weeks out from the U.S. election, police say they have stopped another assassination attempt on Donald Trump's life. This was a third such attempt, but was thwarted early in California. But I'm just wondering if these outside agitators will start up on election day. Let's say you win. I mean, let's not let's let's remember you've got 50,000 Chinese nationals in this country in the last couple of years. Yeah. You have people on the terrorist watch list, 350 in the last couple of years. Right. Um, what are you expecting? Joe Biden said he doesn't think it's going to be a peaceful election day. Well, he doesn't have any idea what's happening in North Carolina. He spends most of his day sleeping. Uh, I 
think the bigger problem is the enemy from within. A relative now of the Afghan man accused of plotting an election day terror attack right here in the U.S. is reportedly charged with planning an attack in France targeting a stadium there or perhaps a shopping center. This according to NBC News. Prosecutors have not identified that suspect, but they have identified 27-year-old Nasir Tawhidi, who was arrested last week in Oklahoma. Investigators say he was planning to target large gatherings here on U.S. soil come election day and that he planned to also die in that attack. The feds say this is the suspect seen here reading a book to his daughter and another child about the rewards that a martyr gets in the afterlife. About the rewards that a martyr gets in the afterlife. Uh, Alex, he's already a big political donor apart from his family, pouring $5.7 million since 2018 into Democratic PACs and campaigns. And like you said, he's, he's known to flaunt his liberal connections. You do a quick scan of social media, it shows countless pictures with world leaders, Democratic mainstays, the, the president, the VP, Nancy Pelosi. I wanted to share this with you. It was interesting. He shared that speech nowadays he feels is too restricted. Not everyone is buying it, though. Elon Musk saw that. He tweeted this, saying, quote, if he's serious about freedom of speech, then we have common ground. But destroying public safety by electing DAs who won't prosecute violent criminals needs to stop. Yes, George Soros and his Open Societies Foundation, which is the main uh, vehicle that he uses to fund various activism and initiatives the its influence on u.s elections cannot be overstated so it's it's a couple of tranches one is partnering with these ngos to fast track immigrants basically coming in through the asylum system or other systems and fast tracking their naturalization process alex soros george's son just met with the vp candidate tim waltz you know the family's influence especially in areas like criminal justice immigration voting rights extremely left wing you have a guy in a billionaire's apartment in new york city with the cityscape behind them and, uh, of course, this guy uh, inherited all of his money from his daddy. Uh, and what I think is so interesting about this picture is the campaign didn't release this. It was Alex Soros who released this picture. And the reason that, that he released the picture is because he not only did uh, Tim Walls come to his apartment to sell his soul, <laughs> He wants the world to know that he owns his soul. That's what that picture... Tim Walls come to his apartment to sell his soul. <laughs> he wants the world to know that he owns his soul. Before former President Donald Trump took the stage in Coachella, an armed man was arrested just a quarter mile away from the campaign rally Saturday night. The local sheriff says 49-year-old Ben Miller illegally had a shotgun, loaded handgun, and a high-capacity magazine. They say the arrest did not impact the safety of the former president or event attendees. Now also, according to the sheriff's department, Miller had several passports and driver's licenses in his possession, all with different names. The black SUV Miller was driving was unregistered and the license plate was homemade and part of the group who claimed to be sovereign citizens. Miller is a registered Republican that tried to run for state assembly in Nevada. That was back in 2022. Riverside County Sheriff says that man appears to be a member of an anti-government group. That's right. The suspect is claiming that this was all a misunderstanding. He was arrested for illegal possession of a loaded firearm, but it's not clear what his intention was during the Trump rally. There is absolutely no way that any of us are going to truly know what was in his head. Uh, I can tell you that none of the other probably 50,000 people that showed up yesterday for that event brought multiple passports with different names and guns. They're so tired of seeing what's happened to this country. They're so tired of seeing the incompetence, seeing the, the border. And I think the border is maybe a bigger deal than even inflation. Inflation is a massive word. What's not public are details about the arrest or the scope of the plot. The suspect may have gotten to the U.S. through his ties to the government that may have earned him a special visa after the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. The suspect may have gotten to the U.S through his ties to the government and to the U.S. through his ties to the government that may have earned him a special visa after the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. All right, some new disturbing video now shedding light on a Kentucky County Sheriff who is being charged with the shooting death of a judge inside of his court chambers. Sheriff Sean Steins made his first appearance 
in court last week. That video is just so hard to be able to watch there where he pled not guilty. Police say Steins shot Judge Kevin Mullins multiple times last week after an argument inside a Kentucky courtroom. They have not offered any details about a possible motive, but if convicted, Steins could serve up to 20 years to life in prison. So I want to bring in Chief Legal Analyst Kelly Rose's conversation right now. I'm mean, just seeing that it's so disturbing. I got to ask you first, it seems like there was some time there that was happening and also to point out, as you mentioned off camera, that that's not where the shooting actually happened, but there was some conversation it looked like. So this was a crime of passion. Yeah, the original pause is not the shooting. You can see he's looking for multiple angles and when you look at the entire video, he looks like he got about four different shots in that situation. Um, but the, his attorney argued that exact same thing. His attorney he wants the entire video released prior to the shooting so they can see exactly what was happening because his client is obviously telling them that something else was occurring prior to this happening. And, and you can look at it. This sheriff was already under a federal investigation. They had lunch together, him and the judge. And so there was already this personal connection multiple days before the shooting took place. And so because of that, his attorney saying, look, he shouldn't even be charged with murder. It should be a manslaughter charge. It should be heat of passion. The judge denied it, kept a murder charge there. But I agree with, with your assessment from looking at that video. The first approach is this looks like it's something personal. It doesn't just look like a random shoot. Yeah, and also to be able to point out, though, because when you look at what's on video, again, this you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Make that point. Uh, but the video, I mean, we're seeing people on the video. We're seeing what's happening going on. If you did it, why plead not guilty? Well, you plead not guilty because you save your, yourself for another day. Pleading guilty, the case is over right there. He goes to prison for 20 years to life. You plead not guilty, you get an opportunity for a preliminary hearing. At that preliminary hearing, his, uh, his attorney will make an argument for a lesser charge. He'll make an argument for some type of pretrial release. He'll make multiple arguments to try to put his defendant, his client, in a situation where he can get some type of lesser charge than what he was already facing, which was life without parole. And so the goal is, okay, we'll, we'll not plead guilty and we'll figure out what avenues we have. One of the things that this, the sheriff said is when they were arresting him, just treat me fairly. And he says, hey, they're trying to take and kidnap my daughter and my wife. Now, those are the statements that the sheriff made when he was arrested. And so he must have some alt alternate type of theory or defense if he's this defense attorney to try to figure out how he maneuvers him out of there. I will say this. The arrest in North Carolina is not a defense to murder. So even if you are under arrest, you feel like your life is in danger and you're, you know, someone's threatening you to do something for you, that's not a defense to murder someone else. Right. So if you're saying that someone was threatening to kidnap your daughter or threatening to kidnap your wife, whatever his allegations are, that still wouldn't be a justification to then do that as a defense in this issue. Tonight here with the news coming in, the CDC investigating a deadly E. coli outbreak involving McDonald's. The outbreak has been linked to quarter pounders. The warning from the CDC just in one ingredient they're now looking into, the sliced onions used for those quarter pounders, but they have not said for sure that that was the culprit. At least 49 people sickened in 10 states. At least 10 people have been hospitalized. Hospitalized. One person has died, but the CDC says the outbreak may go beyond these states. McDonald's said in a statement late today the initial investigation linked to a single supplier that serves three distribution centers. For now, the company has stopped using fresh sliced onions and they're pulling quarter pounders in the affected states. ABC's Ariel Reshef leading us off tonight. Tonight, the CDC is warning of a deadly E. coli outbreak linked to the McDonald's quarter pounder. At least 49 people in 10 states have gotten sick between September 27th and October 11th. 10 had to be hospitalized, including a child with severe kidney complications. Colorado reporting the most cases with 27 and one death, reportedly an older person. E. coli is a bacteria that can cause serious illness, including fever, stomach cramps, and in in severe cases can be deadly. All of the people who got sick reported eating at McDonald's beforehand. Most reporting they ate a quarter pounder hamburger. McDonald's removing the sandwich from the menu in affected areas, saying in a statement a subset of illnesses may be linked to slivered onions used in the quarter pounder and sourced by a single supplier that serves three distribution centers. It's important to note that the majority of states and the majority of menu items are not affected. This is a temporary change as the investigation continues and we are working quickly to return our full menu in these states as soon as possible. David, McDonald's shares dropped 9% in after-hours trading after the CDC's announcement. The CDC, the FDA, and state health officials are all investigating. David? Ariel Resha. Is, is we, we evacuated people so fast out of that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. It doesn't give you time to properly vet the people. And when you don't do that, you leave vulnerabilities. 
Lawmakers say the suspect may have slipped through the cracks. That's why they demand more information, yet court documents about the case are vague. The administration is on the defensive. The individual uh, came in through parole, an Afghan national, and when we vet, and we do so intensively, when we vet an individual, mm -hmm. if we obtain information subsequently that suggests the individual could be of danger, we take appropriate law enforcement action. That is exactly what we did in this case. What feds want to understand is when the suspect developed the terror plot. And here's the question. Was this a long-standing conspiracy from when he lived in Afghanistan, or did he engineer the plans once he arrived on American shores? And Americans won't realize the very real threat there, as in a ISIS terrorist six months ago planning an attack to ISIS terrorists just now days ago planning an attack for three weeks from now. This is real. Well, I always say so. We have two enemies. We have the outside enemy, and then we have the enemy from within. And the enemy from within, in my opinion, is more dangerous than China, Russia, and all these countries, because if you have a smart president, he can handle them pretty easily. I handled, I got along great with all of them. I handled them. And while you're on this, let's talk about the single greatest scandal, in my opinion, in broadcast history. 60 Minutes in CBS interviewed Kamala, and she's incompetent. She gave them the dumbest answer anyone's ever heard. So they took that answer out, threw it away. Now to the crisis in the Middle East. Israel sees one of its bloodiest days since the start of the war as it exchanges deadly airstrikes with Hezbollah. And today the U.S. pledges to send troops and a new air defense system to Israel. It is the first time U.S. forces have been deployed to Israel since the Hamas-led attacks there on October 7th of last year. And this follows another weekend of deadly airstrikes in Israel, Lebanon, and the Gaza Strip. This morning, the IDF says a drone strike in central Israel killed four soldiers and wounded more than 60 other people. The Iranian-backed militant group Hezbollah now claiming responsibility. Uh, shipments to Israel used as leverage to bring this war to an end, and this is uh, clearly the opposite of that, as uh, more uh, weapons are being sent to Israel, and now American troops are being put uh, on the ground to operate them. We're not going to let our ally fight alone in the Middle East while it's encircled by a ring of fire. Since the Iranian Revolution in 1979, revolutionary slogans and pictures of fallen troops have decorated the streets of the capital, Tehran. But this refers to an approaching war, one Foreign Minister Abbas Arakhji is on a regional tour to avert. In 10 days, he has visited Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Oman. Jordan and Egypt are to follow. He is trying to boost regional cooperation to stop Israeli attacks on Gaza and Lebanon, but most importantly, to deter Israel from attacking Iran. We're fully prepared for war. We're not afraid of war, but we seek peace and will make efforts to achieve it. Israeli officials say their response to Iran's attack earlier this month is imminent and will be devastating. Iranians are taking this threat more seriously since the U.S. announced it will be sending a missile defense system to Israel with around 100 American troops to operate it. Arachi says there will be no red lines in defending Iranian interests, hinting his country could target American troops if Israel attacks. It's significant because Iranians often indicate Muscat as a preferred location for negotiations. Iran and the U.S. have held many rounds of talks in the city, notably the ones that resulted in a nuclear deal in 2015. The primary targets for an attack are Iran's nuclear facilities and oil and gas reserves, its economic lifelines, which are well protected. Iran's air defense systems are installed around refineries, power plants, and other strategic locations. However, one of Israel's biggest challenge is distance. It will need countries in the region to open their airspace. If any country allows Israel to use its airspace against Iran, then Iran will respond to that country accordingly. If any American base in the region is used to facilitate an Israeli attack against Iran, then Iran will hit those same American bases. Hmm. Well, thankfully, they did stop him. But there's another threat that the Justice Department is growing increasingly concerned about, and that's Iran. 
Iran has a hit list of former Trump aides involved in the strike that took out Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. And the DOJ is warning that Iran's efforts to assassinate Trump and members of that list are much more extensive and aggressive than previously reported. And it is hard to protect them all. It's a stark reminder of what I think is maybe an inflection point in this country about the threats to a political candidate, the top political candidate in this case, has had to attempts on his life. Now this, and we're in a threat environment that long after this election's over past November 5th, we need to be thinking about, you know, what we're going to do to address these things. They were always out walking their dogs and with their kids on bikes and everybody knew them. Our other top story out of Falls City, investigators say a shooting left five out of seven family members dead and neighbors in shock. The King County Sheriff's Office says a teen is in custody tonight and will be booked on possible murder charges. Thank you for joining us for Fox 13 News at 10. I'm Sabir Rayford. And I'm David Rose. Fox 13's Jennifer Dowling is here to share where this investigation goes from here. And Jen, what are neighbors telling you about this family? say the oldest teen in the home they believe was around 15 years old. They say although the parents oftentimes kept to themselves busy with work at home projects, the kids were often out in the neighborhood socializing, stopping by to say hi, and sometimes even helping with projects around the neighborhood. I only saw the children in the driveway yesterday, yesterday afternoon. As the rain fell on Lake Alice Monday, it matched the somber mood of neighbors like Lynn Trowan. I'm just, just in total shock and keep bursting into tears. Watching as King County deputies investigated a shooting that devastated the large family that was well known in this lakeside community. The kids would come over and, and 4th of July and play with the sparklers and everything. Troran says the five kids could be seen fishing and boating from the water's edge here off the beach of their lakeside home all summer. The little girl just recently painted me a picture and she gave it to me like a couple of months ago and I still have that little picture. Neighbors said the kids were helpful, well behaved and the whole family could be seen walking around the lake almost daily. So polite, homeschooled, and it's just it's unfathomable. Sunday, the sound of music could still be heard coming from the kids' piano in the garage. It was very quiet there yesterday, up to about 4 o'clock. I think they came home from somewhere. And the kids were just running up and down in the driveway as usual. One of the boys was playing the piano in the garage, and, and then it started to rain, so I came in. The music was silenced overnight, just before 911 calls started coming in. The King County Sheriff's Office reports that the teen girl was shot two times, but was able to get out of the house to get help. We learned that there was uh, a neighbor who had medical experience who was uh, providing aid to an injured individual, uh, presumably who had been shot but was surviving. Deputies described chaos upon arrival with two adults and three kids dead in the home. They immediately took one uh, young male, teenage male, into custody. It does appear to be that this is a family incident, uh, clearly a domestic violence incident that involves not only uh, a young man who's now in significant uh, trouble, and he, uh, it involves firearms. Deputy Mellis says the girl that escaped was taken to Harborview for treatment. I just, I just keep seeing the faces and those children. I don't know the details or anything, but um, I know something terrible has happened there, so... What's next? The investigation will continue tonight. As you can see, it's still ongoing behind me. And then investigators say they will expand it, executing multiple search warrants on things like cell phones and social media apps to try to learn more about what... Her throat was slit. She was able to wrestle away, getting even more cuts in the process. Stitches at the hospital and a trauma the seven-year-old little girl hasn't even processed yet. A guy came up to me. He was like that. And then he got one hand. He didn't have anything on his hand. He did, like, put my face up. And then he, the other hand was, like, a knife. And he, he just, like, came out of nowhere and just slid the knife on me. Seven-year-old Seda Masra at a park on Detroit's far west side this week with her grandma attacked at random by a 73-year-old man. When he came towards my grandma, I ran home and then and then my grandma was screaming, what, what, what? Everybody was saying, like, knife, 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 but she didn't understand. So I told her in the Arabic. So 
so she can know. Sada kicked him and ran to her nearby home, showing mom what he'd done, slashed her throat, and tried to puncture her stomach with a pocket knife. His hair was gray. Here was his hair, and here was his hair, but the middle was bald. Sada describing her alleged attacker, Gary Lansky, now charged with assault with intent to murder and assault with a deadly weapon. When neighbors saw what happened at Ryan Park, they jumped in, corralling Lansky until police got there. When we went out to the park, I mean, the children there, they were just horrified. They were traumatized. Detroit Police Commander Vernell Newsom says Lansky was oddly calm when he was arrested. We figured that he perhaps had some type of uh, breakdown or was experiencing a, a mental uh, crisis. The elderly man facing additional charges for domestic violence against his wife before this attack. I'll tell him you're a very mean guy and you're very a bad guy because I wish you never came out of the prison. It came out in court today that Lansky also allegedly used a knife in that domestic violence attack on his wife and sister in regards to the case. With little Seda, he was given a $2 million cash bond. Jessica Dupnak, Fox 2 News. Russian President Vladimir Putin said on Friday at a press conference in Turkmenistan, a country in Central Asia, that a new world order is necessary where wealth is distributed more fairly and the voice of every nation is heard. In the current difficult situation where the world is facing unprecedented threats, when international relations are entering the era of deep-rooted changes, when we're building the new world order that reflects the variety of the whole planet, and this natural process is irreversible that Russia advocates for nationally wide international discussion on the cooperation in the multipolar world that is being built today. We're open to discussing issues of building the new world order with all of our friends, partners, and like-minded friends. Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, has met with his Iranian counterpart, President Masoud Fazeshkian, for the first time. The two leaders held face-to-face -face talks at a regional summit in Turkmenistan, where they joined a number of heads of state from other Central Asian and Arab states. The Kremlin said the Russian and Iranian presidents discussed mutual relations as well as the situation in the Middle East. The meeting comes amid soaring tensions in the region. Russia has increasingly been inviting Iranian officials to events. Analysts say it's an attempt to show that Moscow is not isolated. It's not clear if Russia will back Iran in the event of a full-scale war with Israel. Que a la luz de todo lo que está sucediendo en Oriente Medio, la comunidad internacional cese de exportar armas al gobierno de Israel. Creo que esto es de urgencia y este es un llamamiento que que voy a hacer de desde el primer instante al conjunto de la comunidad internacional el cesar de exportar armas al gobierno Russia is increasingly leaning closer to the anti-American forces in the region this being Iran its proxies and the Assad regime in Syria in fact Russian military base in Syria was nearly attacked by Israel and missiles and many have been speculating whether this can um, lead to further escalations for the last year Israel has been fighting a war on what is now seven fronts and and there's one thing that has that is in common to all of those fronts, whether it's Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, and, and much more. The one thing in common is the revolutionary Islamic government in Tehran, which has been subjugating the people of Iran since 1979, and whose regional ambitions have been out in the open for a very long time and are absolutely explicit at the moment. And whose regional ambitions have been out in the open for a very long time and are absolutely explicit at the moment.